the end of the afternoon. That will continue for parts of Cornwall into the evening and overnight. Cloudier skies towards the southwest and some cloud elsewhere, but uh, generally speaking, the clearest air will be in the east and the north, and that's where the lowest temperatures will be as we start off Thursday. But it's not going to be a cold start to the day, only slightly less mild compared with Wednesday morning. It's going to be bright in the east and the north first thing, a touch of frost for northern Scotland. But for the rest of the UK, cloudier skies and that cloud spreads across all areas by the afternoon. Some light outbreaks of rain and drizzle for England and Wales. More persistent rain expected for Scotland and Northern Ireland by the end of the day. And it's here where it will turn increasingly windy as well with the risk of gales in places overnight. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 pm on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. So I'm please. completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. No spin, no bias, no censorship. This is Dan Wooten tonight with me, Mark Dolan. Coming up, New Year, same old fear-mongering. The government has backed an unevidenced warning for Brits to mask up if they feel unwell to, you guessed it, save the NHS. This is a performative mission creep, and I'll explain why giving in again will leave us with medical tyranny forever. Masks. Thanks, but no thanks. That's next. Then I'll get the views of my superstar panel, Christine Hamilton, John Sargent and Rebecca Reed. But forget mindlessly muzzling the nation. Is privatising the NHS the only way to save it? We'll hear from both sides on that one in The Clash at 9.20. As Britain braces for the worst week of rail disruption for 30 years, could facing down the unions be Rishi Sunak's Falklands moment? 
And what does he need to do to see off the Marxist barons? That is our big debate at 10. At 10.45, former Sun editor Kelvin McKenzie is uncancelled to answer a simple question. Should Prince Harry put a sock in it? Don't miss that. Also, should trans doctors be banned from giving intimate care to women and girls? Woke NHS bosses don't see a problem. But legendary father Ted creator and defender of women's rights Graham Lenehan gives his opposing view at 9.35. An outbreak of common sense as England rugby star Maro Itoji says that we should be singing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, despite its links to slavery. Should sports fans be allowed to sing songs that some consider offensive? Former Mumford and Sons musician turned freedom fighter Winston Marshall is live at 10.20. Also, is 2023 the year that we let men be men again? Social commentator Leia Halpen gives her defence of masculinity in The Outsider at 9.50. We'll see if she can get me to man up a bit. Plus, I'll bring you tomorrow's newspapers as they drop and crown the greatest Britain and Union jackass before the night is out. But that mask monologue is on its way. You won't want to miss it. I'm not pulling my punches. This is Dan Wooden tonight. Let's go. That's right, my digest is coming. But first, the news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Good evening, I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Uh, the disgraced former boss of FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried, has pleaded not guilty to multiple fraud charges following the collapse of his cryptocurrency exchange. He's accused of stealing billions of dollars from customers and investors to fund his hedge fund, to buy property and make political donations. Prosecutors say Bankman-Fried orchestrated one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. If convicted, he could face more than 100 years in prison. The health secretary is blaming COVID, flu and the threat of strep A for the extra pressure being put on the NHS. His comments come amid mounting concern over the winter crisis, with more than a dozen NHS trusts and ambulance services declaring critical incidents over the festive period. Medical experts say up to 500 people are dying each week as a result of delays in urgent care. But Steve Barclay says the government is working to reduce the backlog. Focusing the funding onto the operations backlogs, for example, getting more diagnostic hubs in place, getting the surgical hubs that we're rolling out, uh, getting the backlog from the pandemic reduced. That's been the key priority. That's where we've surged additional funding. But we also recognise the big pressure that we're seeing played through in terms of ambulance handover delays is largely uh, triggered by those who are fit to leave hospital but delayed in doing so. And we need to free up that bed capacity. And that is often about having the right social care provision to do so. Rail passengers will face continued disruption for the rest of the week as a result of fresh strikes by the RMT union. Roughly half of Britain's railway lines are closed with only a fifth of services running. Many places, including most of Scotland and Wales, have no trains running at all. The Transport Secretary Mark Harper says the government's offered a very fair pay offer, but the RMT maintains there's been no new proposal and is accusing the government of blocking an agreement. People travelling to the UK from China will not have to self-isolate if they test positive for COVID on arrival. The government says testing is designed to collect information in the absence of transparent coronavirus data from Chinese authorities. From Thursday, those flying to the UK to Heathrow Airport from China will be required to show a negative COVID test before boarding the plane. And thousands of mourners in Brazil line the streets of Santos to pay their final respects to the footballing legend Pele. His coffin, draped in a Brazilian flag, was carried through the streets on a fire truck to a private family funeral where Pele was finally laid to rest. Earlier, some 230,000 mourners, including the country's new president, filed past Pele's open casket to pay homage to the three-time World Cup winner. Pele died last week at the age of 82, after battling colon cancer. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. And now it is back to Mark.
Here we go again. Don't say I didn't warn you. Professor Susan Hopkins, the chief medical advisor at the UK Health Security Agency, has urged the public to wear face masks if they feel unwell in new advice issued to try to stop the spread of flu. Now, you know the old saying, the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, that seems to be a good way of summing up public health these days. Surely three years after the arrival of COVID, we're not still flogging these filthy, wretched muzzles, are we? Have we really got to go through all of this again? Face masks are environmentally catastrophic, non-recyclable, with billions now discarded, making their way into the sea and slowly threatening the food chain. Well done, everyone. They impede economic activity, human interaction, they affect education, and as I experienced at an NHS hospital yesterday, they are a disaster for patient care, as the truly excellent doctors and nurses that I engaged with kept removing their face masks in order to get their point across. What's the point in that? It's cruel on doctors and nurses to make them wear these devices all day long, and it can't be good for their health either. And they're mostly wearing those flimsy blue masks that the Germans didn't even accept during their strict N95 and FFP2 mask mandates of 2021. Which, by the way, rates of viral spread show haven't helped Germany either. Covid theatre at its very worst. I say no to N95 and FFP2 can FFP off. These masks are just there to virtue signal what a nice person you are. Whilst in my view, the only thing they actually signal is that you don't understand science. Don't take my word for it, former SAGE advisor Dr Colin Axon told The Telegraph in the summer of 2021 the following. He said, standard face coverings are just comfort blankets that do little to reduce the spread of COVID particles. He accused medics of presenting a cartoonish view of how tiny particles travel through the air. He warned that some masks have gaps which are invisible to the naked eye, but which are 5,000 times the size of viral COVID particles. He went on, imagine marbles being fired at builders' scaffolding. Some might hit a pole and rebound, but most will fly through. Well, he was just as eloquent on this very show in October 2021. What's your view about the efficacy of face coverings? The physics and the engineering would indicate that uh, certainly aerosol-sized particles and obviously molecules of air that we're breathing in and out, um, but also the aerosols, which are tiny microscopic particles, which are, you know, can contain some molecules, some water vapour, perhaps some bits of lining of nose or throat. I won't delve too much into that. Um, but they are of the order of a, a thousandth of a millimetre in diameter. And that's in area terms, at least a thousand times smaller than the smallest gaps or the smallest pore sizes in a surgical, the, the, this, the blue surgical mask. Um, the cloth masks are, are worse still. Not exactly a ringing endorsement, is it? Most egregiously, these face coverings are about control. They're about compliance. They represent obedience. And masks, while scientifically debatable, are irredeemably woke. Why else do so many nutters have them in their Twitter bios online? Whenever I see one of those, I always think, what a cult. I personally made headlines around the world and provoked a viral video when I chopped up a face mask early in the pandemic on my old radio show. Well, that moment has aged well, and I'm delighted to say that most Brits are now voting with their faces and voting with their smile. This winter, I've noticed even people in supposedly clinically vulnerable groups are going around unmasked. Throughout December, when attending various packed events, awards dinners, Christmas lunches, pub events, restaurants, you name it, people were squeezed into big venues mask-free. And yesterday, at a major NHS hospital, even the receptionist who saw me was wonderfully maskless. I could actually hear what she was saying, and it was such a treat. After three million years of evolution, when did we become so afraid of colds and flu? I sent out this tweet before Christmas 
It expressed that exact sentiment and it went viral, no pun intended. I tweeted, sitting on a packed train, no masks in sight, people coughing and wheezing, no fear of germs, just normal life, absolute heaven. Now, if the pandemic has taught us one thing, it's that if you give the authorities an inch, they'll take a mile, which is why masking up this winter will open the door to future medical tyranny, the likes of which we've only just escaped. What starts as a suggestion becomes an instruction. It's my view that recommending masks is really just the authorities covering our faces to cover their asses. So with hospitals clearly under pressure, the authorities revert to type and go for window dressing by getting us to wear masks. They're being seen to do something. But I cannot sign up to any more of this nonsense when it's clear now after three years of COVID measures that countries with strict mask mandates produce no noticeably better outcomes than those that were mask free. Sweden, who never mandated masks, boasted one of the lowest excess death rates in Europe. Florida shamed California by going mask free months earlier and yet boast comparable age adjusted outcomes. If masks worked, we would know by now. They would have moved the dial. But for all of their damage, the figures would suggest they've delivered precious little. China, the most recent example where draconian mask rules have done nothing to stop an explosion in COVID cases. So don't forget the horrors of British children as young as 11 sat in the classroom all day long wearing those filthy, restrictive devices with no evidence it would help. Let's not go back to that. If we don't reject masks now, they will be with us forever. The only place you'll get a mask on me this winter is where the sun doesn't shine. Good luck trying. What's your view? Dan at GBnews.uk responding to my Big Opinion monologue and the big stories of the day, my superstar panel, writer and broadcaster Christine Hamilton, political journalist, broadcasting legend John Sargent, and author and journalist Rebecca Reed. Uh, John, let me start with you. We must not cave in to the tyrannical measures of government. Yes, I think it's a bit strong, Mark, your <laughs> views about this. Now, what you, what, you, what you forget about all this is the psychological effect of people feeling they're doing something to help. What and if they're not? I know, but the th but you shouldn't sneer at that. During the war, uh, people were encouraged to knock down their cast iron railings because they were told if they could collect them together, they would make a spitfire. So people knocked down all sorts of railings. You can still see it now, where railings have been cut to do this. Now, of course, to convert railings into spitfires would have been incredibly expensive. Very difficult to do. So behind the scenes, they simply piled them up. But people felt they were contributing to the war effort. Now, you can sneer at it now and you can say but how primitive... But are we going to do that forever, no, no, wait a moment. <laughs> but you can say how primitive hmm. and how absurd. But bear in mind that people got through this incredible war with thousands of casualties. People have gone through the pandemic with thousands of casualties. And there has been a feeling we're all in this together, we're trying to do our bit. Mm. Now, lots of people have suffered because they don't feel that, and they're still suffering from mental health problems and all sorts of difficulties. But don't underestimate the power of that, the feeling that, what are you doing to help? Well, I'm wearing my mask, I think I'm doing what I'm told to do. And people need that reassurance that they're helping. That's all I would say. But you acknowledge with your uh, wartime anecdote that masks don't work. Well, so they it may... is performative, it is theatre. They may or may not work, but what they do do we is they do... Now, we no, they provide reassurance, that's all. They may say, how much reassurance, and is it worth it, and does it seem sensible, and you're right to question it. But don't say it's rubbish, and don't say it's all to do with authoritarian madness, and these are tyrants who are trying to put us all in a sort of military camp. It's not as simple as that. These are very difficult, elaborate ways in which large populations get over these horrendous problems. Well, That's an old all. friend of yours, Sir Graham Brady, who, uh, back on your previous beat as uh, the chief uh, political correspondent of the BBC and, of course, the ITN and elsewhere, 
Um, he pointed out in July 2021 that really these masks are about compliance and it is about fear-mongering because at the time the government wanted us to be afraid of the virus. Now, again, perhaps that's justified, but it's now 2023, yeah, John, and is it not time to move on? No, of course it's time to move on. Um, if, you, if you travel about, or I was in, as it turned out, I was in hospital today, um, and the nurses were wearing masks, but they were saying it's up to you to do whatever you want to do, and, and they said it in such a cheerful, friendly way. I thought that's rather nice. Well, there was no I, sense of, yeah. you must do this, sure. we're tyrannical, we're trying to force you. No, they were being very British about it. And, John, John you raised a good it. point, and Rebecca Reed, John raises a good point, that at the moment it's not tyranny, it's just a suggestion from uh, Susan Hopkins. Uh, but uh, we've learned in the pandemic that what starts as a suggestion becomes an instruction, so I'm naturally quite sensitive to it. I find it quite triggering. I, I know you do, and I'm sad for you because I think it seems to genuinely upset you. I don't feel the same way. I'm, I'm not so uh, bruised by this. Give experience. them an inch and they'll take a mile. I, I, I respect where you're coming from, but for me, I think this is much more similar to the idea of asking people to sneeze into their elbow, which is also a public health campaign. We know that if somebody sneezes... I, I personally have a cold right now, you might be able to tell. Um, but if you sneeze, it's polite not to sneeze into a room of assembled company. And I think the way that we're talking about masks at the moment is to say... It's one of the things you can do to try and avoid spreading a cold. Mm -hmm. Nobody is saying it's a silver bullet, it's foolproof, unless you're going to wear a full proper mask we, we and change did, every three hours. We did so hours. well without masks for millennia. Why do we have to have them now every winter? Bec well, I suppose because... What's changed? Because we're desperately trying to avoid people being in hospital because there's absolutely no capacity. Mm. Do we, want to, use, do we want to use devices wherein the holes are 5,000 times well, that, bigger than a COVID particle? That is almost as pointless as the masks that I made on my sewing machine at the beginning of the right. pandemic. Right. Um, if, you, if you want to wear a mask to truly protect yourself, you need to get a proper I can never remember N N95. N95, and you need to change it every three hours or whatever. Or was it FFP2? You, they I, can FFP but off. Really I thought that was worth a revisit. That line. Mm, really? uh, just keep 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 telling the joke until we laugh. Mark, <laughs> repeat so funny. <laughs> um, but if somebody was standing next to me on the tube and they were going to sneeze down my neck, I'd rather they have one of those on than nothing. Very Christine, help. It's two against one here. <laughs> Throw well, me a bone. Um, I don't actually personally feel really threatened by it because I don't think it's going to happen. If masks had been proved to have any effect at all, then I'm all fine. Let, let's sure. do it. But as Rebecca just said, there's masks and masks. I mean, that thing, you might as well just not bother. But if you're, if you're really worried about it... I, one thing that worries me about it is that it gives people a false sense of security. They've got one mm. of those things on and they think, oh, fine, I'm not going to catch anything, I'm not going to pass anything on. But give an inch and take a mile. I, I don't think that these are coming down the line as mandatory. But it's so better I than people think, being... Uh, I think you're worrying Christine, about isn't it better, nothing, I really do. Christine, I isn't think it, it's, uh, Christine, it's a defence, isn't it better, a defence manoeuvre on my part. But isn't it better that people, you know, they might feel, give them a false sense of security? But isn't that better than people just being terrified? They can't. I don't, I don't think people are they terrified can't. anymore. I think a, a lot of people people... are frightened. Well, uh, they should not be frightened because there's nothing to be frightened of now. COVID well, is it, calm them down. We, but how? We were worried in the outset. At the outset, of course, we were understandable. Mm -hmm. We had no idea what was coming down the track. So of course, we obeyed everything. We stayed indoors and we wore masks pathetically thinking that they were going to have some yeah. effect. But I don't think people are afraid of it now. There are a I few very elderly, very vulnerable for other reasons. I think scars on people, though. And they... I, I mm. think if you, if you meet somebody who was a teenager in the late 80s, early 90s, they will talk about HIV with true yes, horror. They, they, I, 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 this is before my time, but those gravestone adverts, mm. apparently. Oh. Um, and I think it's like all the whistle down the wind, nuclear apocalypse, these are all before my time. But those, those things... Don I remember. Yes, but people, I remember them quite... Scars on people, yeah. people don't thought they, they could I know, I know the people who decided from, to do from it. A teacup. Yeah. That was the trouble. But, but it was lack people... of information and education. But, but they've now got the information and we've yes. all been educated. But well, I, su my... I suppose yeah. I just feel like they need to... Un maybe there's, there's some unlearning to okay. do. Well, my, my, view, my view on masks is once bitten, twice shy. Uh, that's my view if... Essentially, you uh, accept masks this winter, they'll be with us forever and we'll just be a masking country. That's not a country I want to live in. And by the way, whatever happened to environmental concerns? These things are not recyclable. Uh, and by the way, is it great for human health to wear a mask for prolonged periods? It can't be. But look, it's all about opinions. Fascinated by what John and Rebecca have had to say on that. What's your view? Dan at gbnews.uk. A lot more to come. My brilliant panel return. But coming up, should trans doctors be stopped from giving intimate care to women? Father Ted creator Graham Lenehan gives his take at 9.35. But first, in the clash, as A&E wait times are set to hit record 
highs and hospitals declare critical incidents. Should we privatise the NHS? Let me know what you think. Email down at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. And there's a poll up. You can vote in that now. The results are next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. We do love a right old ding-dong on this show, so it's time for The Clash. The chair of the British Medical Association has warned the NHS is under intolerable and unsustainable pressure after several hospitals declared critical incidents in recent days. NHS England's Chief Strategy Officer Chris Hopson blamed multiple factors, including a lack of staff, an increase in both COVID and flu patients, and an 18% rise in A&E walk-ins in recent weeks. Nurses and ambulance workers are planning to strike again in England this month, and yet Downing Street has claimed the NHS has all the money it needs. So with our health sector in a worse state than ever before, and at a funding impasse, I'm asking, is it time to privatise the NHS? 
Uh, let me know your views, dan at gbnews.uk. Tweet us at gbnews. And do vote in the Twitter poll. We'll bring you those results shortly. But to debate this, I'm delighted to welcome senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School, an old friend of mine, Professor David Strain, and director of the Bruges Group, uh, which is a Thatcherite organisation. It's Robert Olds. Uh, Robert, should we privatise the NHS? Absolutely. It's time that the Britain followed the example of other countries in Europe. Even though we've Brexited, we should follow countries like Germany, which has more than half its hospitals as private. It's still free at the point of delivery, but it's a multi-payer system where, of course, the money comes from the taxpayer and through private insurance schemes. And there is choice in the system. There is competition. There is at the professional input of people who know about procurement rather than the system we have in Britain where we have, dare I say, underfunded, underqualified, unprofessional, in many cases, managers who can't really handle the system. We have doctors, nurses, other health professionals, surgeons doing a great job in the NHS, but they're let down by the system because it's inefficient. So we're spending more than £160 billion a year on healthcare in this country and, of course, it's not going to where it's needed because it's not managed properly, because it doesn't have the professional expertise of people who know about procurement, who know about organisation, who know about service delivery and organisation. And only those skills can come from the private sector. And uh, that's David why we need privatisation. Uh, and I hear what you say, Robert, very heartful, heartful, heartfelt uh, comments. But, uh, David Strain... Um, Here's really what Robert is saying. Keep the brilliant doctors and nurses who are the best of us, including your good self, but turn the NHS into an efficient business which is accountable. Um, it's a really interesting concept. And actually, the NHS as it stands at the moment is a hugely efficient service. If you look at the management to workers ratio in the NHS, it's sat at 2.2%. If you compare that to any other industry in the country, it's about 9.4%. If you compare it to the German health system, uh, which Robert is speaking of, they run at about 4.6% managers to actual workers. When we look at the percentage of our GDP that is invested in the National Health Service, we use considerably less of this country's GDP um, compared to Germany, which is the example that you give. And yet we give a health resources that are just as good as those countries. The problem we're facing at the moment is the input into the NHS hasn't kept pace with the GDP. Up until 2008, we were running at about a 4% per annum increase in expenditure, which accounted for the, the ageing population, the different demographics and the different services we could provide. Um, since 2008, that's dropped to about 1% investment, whereas other European countries have maintained that 4%. And that's the reason that we're facing this crisis today. Now, I'm not saying the NHS doesn't require some sort of major um, investment. It also requires major modification. But in order to do this uh, modification, in order to make an NHS fit for the 21st century, we need to invest in the services that we already have to make it more effective. But actually, the efficiency, the ability to reach those patients most in need is still there. It's just that investment is required to bring it up to scratch to today's 21st century needs. Robert Olds, the NHS is incredibly efficient. Well, we have a system in, in Britain at the moment where, of course, we have a massive long waiting lists. Everybody will know about the seven-hour waits at urgent care centres or A&E and, of course, the difficulties of getting to see a GP. Really, there are serious problems in the NHS. We know, of course, the problems that the NHS has suffered as a result of the lockdowns and the, the enormous backlog that's been created and people not having health care and the ex excess deaths, which could indeed result from all that. So there's some real problems facing the NHS, but it goes from crisis to crisis. There's, there's two waiting lists that are too long. And if there was more choice in the system, if there was more plurality, and that's what we're really asking for. We talk, we use the term privatisation, that's a trigger. What we're asking is pl plurality and choice for patients and choice for managers and choice for those who can actually have the opportunity to either, like in France, 
choose to go to a public hospital or a private hospital and it's still free at the point of delivery and the private sector would be able to turn around, deliver services quickly and efficiently that's needed and there would be competition and the system would raise. That's how it works in a country like France and we should follow their example and give choice and that would be a lot more efficient and that would be enabling people to get rid of the waiting list, get things down and get people treated, which is surely what the NHS should be doing. Uh, David Strain, let me reiterate, the doctors and the nurses, the security guards, the hospital porters, uh, they're all absolute heroes and it's a tough, tough job. I've been in a hospital the last couple of days and it's amazing uh, just how much goodwill there is, the long hours, brutal conditions. So this is not about those in the front line, but the bottom line is that the NHS has been asleep at the wheel during an explosion in lifestyle-related illnesses, type 2 diabetes, obesity. Uh, we cannot continue to uh, essentially pay people to have unhealthy lifestyles. And, of course, the NHS went on strike for two and a half years to become the National Covid Service. So it signed its own death warrant, hasn't it? Um, so, so you raise some really important issues. Um, since the lack of investment in the NHS, since this this lack of this four percent real terms growth per annum, we've gone from sticking plaster to sticking plaster to sticking plaster. I, I, I am absolutely uh, overwhelmed that Robert is using the French example, who actually invent uh, who invest forty percent more of their GDP into their health service in order to provide a service that is about the same as the NHS. We are considerably more efficient. And what we need is that investment back into a position where we start preventing David, these... Uh, you, David, you're willfully I blind believe. about the crisis. You're talking Robert. about the, NA, the efficiency in the NHS. What about the massive backlogs that exist in terms of, as I mentioned, the inability in some cases to even see a clinician and get treated in a reasonable amount of time? That doesn't mean there's not the will to do so or the expertise. Robert, what, about the what about the waste? What about the waste? What about the, the middle managers on six-figure salaries? Well, what the about middle... the diversity officers? Indeed, the, the problem, one of the significant problems with the NHS is that it, it's not spending money where it's needed. We have, of course, NHS trusts spending hundreds of thousands of pounds on diversity officers. And really, in a sense, what they will do, they will often just um, move uh, deck chairs around, essentially, on, a, on an organisation which is, which is failing in many instances and just do management training and management... Uh, alterations to give the appearance that they're making improvements in efficiency when actually the money which has increased massively in the NHS since we've had more than the 350 million a week put in since Brexit, put in to the NHS. There's been massive increases in spending. A great deal of that came before COVID and then even more after. And it still hasn't actually okay. resulted in improved outcomes. What we actually need is a system where we have better managers. We need expertise. And at the moment, we have a system of the NHS, which is essentially the taxpayers giving money to the NHS, which is essentially spending it in private. All the 86% of NHS contracts for pharmaceuticals go to the private sector, the drugs, the beds. Many of the items, they're all going into the private sector. So it's bleeding money out, but it's not being handled okay. in a professional way. But, and that's what we need. Robert, OK, uh, uh, I've got to say that I would have... Uh, David, one, one moment. I would, have, I, I would have... Go on, then. ..profitable business. We are about the business of providing health in order to maintain the healthy population that we need to grow our GDP. It is not, not working. profitable to provide health. And therefore, private contractors who come into the NHS are either going to be taking money away from the taxpayer or they are going to leave it. In the examples where private sector has taken over NHS trusts, they have universally given up those trusts, given up those contracts and handed them back because they realise the only way we can provide health is at a cost to the, the taxpayer. And the purpose is we provide health, which generates a more healthy workforce, which enables us to go out and provide the services to grow our GDP. Where you have private providers, they actually cost more to deliver the same standard of care. That article in The Lancet towards the, the end of last year demonstrated very clearly that for every private contractor that takes on a role results in approximately 500 deaths excess okay. because okay. of the...
Did. Be I'm, I'm and me. why? And why? And I'm aware of that study. And part, partly, some of the problems were caused by the changes that were brought in uh, under Andrew Lanzi. Not his fault. He was actually made to do it as health secretary. But that's an argument for another day. Part of the problems is they actually created extra bureaucracy in those changes, an extra bureaucracy overseeing the management of those contracts. So rather than allowing okay. private people to be uh, analysing and managing and buying the contracts and procurement professionally yep. and efficiently is being done by people who are essentially not paid enough and not skilled and responding to layers and layers of bureaucracy. Well, so there's a reason so why... So what you're basically okay. saying is we need to provide more money to those administrators in order to get the service right to provide... We need more professional... Service. We okay. need more professional administrators, we'll to... and that can only be done through private hospitals, just like in Germany, we'll, we'll for instance. To, we'll have to or wrap it course... up. I would have fewer middle managers. I'd have more top doctors, like Professor David Strain. David, thank you for your valuable time and for sharing your thoughts. Uh, of course, uh, David Strain is the uh, Professor of uh, Senior Clinical Medicine at the University of Exeter Medical School. Thank you, David. And the director of the Bruges Group, Robert Olds. Good to see you again, Robert. Uh, what's your view? Should we privatise the NHS? Rob on Twitter says, no, just make sure everyone who's treated can provide a British registered passport or national insurance number. We could still treat foreign nationals, but for a price. Sue Broza on Twitter says, yes, I think it's unfair on those who choose private health insurance and also have to pay national insurance. B on Twitter, we should re-nationalise the parts that are already private and stop outsourcing work to private companies. Cut out the leeches and pay decent wages to the NHS teams. And the verdict is now in. You've had your say. 45% of you think that we should privatise the NHS. 55% say we should not. The people have spoken. Coming up, should we let men be men in 2023? Social commentator Leah Halpern wants this to be the year of the alpha male. She's tonight outsider at 9.50. But first, should we prevent trans doctors from providing intimate care to girls and women? Father Ted creator Graham Linehan gives his take after the break. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. 
Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512, Virgin Media Channel 604, Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236 and UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio with the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It might be a new year, but the trans debate is guaranteed to keep on raging in 2023, not least with news that transgender NHS staff can now treat patients who specifically request same-sex care for intimate procedures. According to a letter seen by the policy exchange think tank, North Bristol NHS Trust said it was unable to guarantee patients would receive treatment by a clinician of the same sex if requested. It also said that doctors and nurses involved in a patient's treatment did not need to disclose their sex to the trust. The letter was penned by the former chief executive of the trust, Evelyn Barker, in February of last year. Well, joining me now is Father Ted and IT crowd creator and women's rights advocate Graham Linehan, who went from TV hero to cancel culture victim for daring to suggest that, quote, men aren't women on Twitter in 2020. Well, listen, Graham, I'm pretty sure that history will judge you kindly. Um, but can we get to the basics of this? What are the practical implications of this issue around intimate care? What, what's the worst case scenario? Well, the worst case, is, <clears throat> the worst case scenario is that you get someone who is very elderly or disabled, uh, unable to um, uh, physically protect themselves from being placed in a position that they don't want to be placed in. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's a, the, the, the thing about this is, um, someone asked me uh, outside, uh, is this how things were 25 years ago? The law hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is that Stonewall uh, developed a different interpretation of the, of the law and started introducing it to institutions all across the UK, including the NHS and, and the police force. So it's kind of like, um, you know, I've said this before, but a soft ideological coup has happened within these places. That mean that the, the the normal rules of engagement, where you can ask for, if you ask for a uh, uh, a cert, certain sex of a of a of a carer, uh, that will be respected. Uh, women can't depend on them anymore. You know, so it's no. So it's, you could say, so for example, it could be like you know your mother or your sister or your daughter or granddaughter. It, this involves girls as well, but uh, an intimate medical examination in which in which possibly the patient is is you know wearing no clothes. Uh, being examined by a biological male that calls themselves a female. Yes, yes, because because uh, Stone. And the female patient can request that it's only a woman that sees them, and that will not be granted. Yes, the 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 patient can no longer be certain of that. I'm sure most most of the time you will get a female carer, mm. but uh, there's an element of um, ambiguity now around the whole question because of the confusion that Stonewall have spread that make it very. Um, uh, that mean that female patients aren't on a sure footing anymore. Um, I mean, there's an extraordinary story uh, a while back of a, an autistic woman named Claire Dimion. I think actually she might be in the House of Lords. Um, and she requested a female carer for a, for a breast exam. And not only did um, they not observe the request, a few weeks or months later, she saw an official piece of NHS documentation and her own letter was quoted inside, they didn't tell her they were republishing it, it was quoted inside this document as an example of a letter from a bigoted uh, person. So even the request is now being flagged up as problematic or, or hateful, you know? And, and there is absolutely nothing hateful about a woman uh, who could have been through God knows what, like um, sexual assault or, or, or something along those lines, child abuse. There's absolutely or nothing. A, a cultural or religious issue. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, That's it, the other thing. It might be. And the left tell, tell me that I've, I've completely lost the plot, but it might be that a woman that doesn't want to have a gynecological examination from somebody that identifies as female, but that is a biological man. And at the heart of this, uh, of course, you're no transphobe. Uh, I would have thought that if somebody chooses to identify by a different gender, and they were Steve and they're now Rebecca, you're a libertarian like me, good luck to you. I'll call you Rebecca. And I'll, uh, you know, indulge in, in some whatever you call it. I, I have a, I have a rule. Uh, if uh, I won't, I w will not give female pronouns to a misogynist. Mm. That's my rule, mm. and I won't observe their name. I won't, I won't do any of that stuff because so much of trans activism is. Uh, is a kind of a sadistic trolling of women mm -hmm. that takes aim at their at their livelihoods and 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 their boundaries and their privacy and their dignity. I won't respect well, that, the pronouns of anyone rough, who but supports. What, what about though? What about you know the, the the people that feel that they're they're in the wrong body and they change their name and they dress as a female? I mean, would you not acknowledge? Uh, yeah, they're, they're, absolutely. If they weren't trolls and they weren't bullies. Yes, and and the thing is, you know, there are so many transsexual people in this fight who are uh, are just watching this aghast at what is being done in, in their name. Including the world's most famous trans woman, Caitlyn Jenner, yeah. who, who said, and she's one of my heroes, said that uh, biological men calling themselves women uh, participating in female sport is completely wrong and completely unfair. So many in the trans community think this is madness too. And this is gender ideology, which I guess a shorthand for it is that um, it, is, it tries to establish the idea that a man is a woman or, or, or a woman is a man, and that's like a biological scientific fact now. And that's what we've now got to accept. Or, that's what you're pushing back on. Or to put it another way, there is no biological basis for whether someone is a man or a woman. Right. Which is a kind of muddying of reality that has implications for the whole of society. Yes, you know? and it uh, could be challenged by the most rudimentary of GCSE biology <laughs> textbooks. Yeah. Uh, given the fact that every cell in the body, I understand, has, has a gender, has a sex, as yeah. it were, chromosomally, very fundamentally. Um, the, the woke takeover of our public institutions is particularly egregious, isn't it, given the fact that we're paying for this nonsense, particularly when it comes to the NHS? Well, we're... we are we rolling this. We probably come at it from a slightly different angle. You know, I've always been a, a, a card-carrying lefty and I've always... Had, and the NHS and the BBC over here have been kind of two kind of what I thought were the jewels in the crown of what England was capable of. But gender ideology has completely corrupted both organisations. You know, the BBC is lying to people, lying to children about there being more than two sexes. The NHS is, is betraying women by, uh, by, by not ensuring that they'll be comfortable at a time when they're at their most vulnerable. I had, I had cancer at one point and, uh, you know, the fear was so great that you really wanted clarity at all times. And that's what the NHS have taken from female patients. They've taken clarity um, and they've taken the kind of, you know, one would expect to be uh, you know, at a time when you're at your most vulnerable, to 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 have trust in an institution and like the NHS. And you would hope that there would be some degree of uh, female safeguarding. This yeah. feels, I mean, in the worst case scenario, as we start our conversation, it's almost like Jimmy Savile on roller skates, isn't it? I've only got a couple of seconds left. I'll get in huge trouble with, with Liam. Um, but um, is gender ideology here to stay? Um, will we look like dinosaurs in 20 years' time? No, it, 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 it's, it's untenable. Unfortunately, though, uh, it looks like, because there's no adults in the room, because Keir Starmer won't uh, defend people like J, uh, J.K. Rowling and Rosie Duffield, mm. um, there, it's going to actually take a, a tragedy before people realise how, how absurd this idea is. Um, Graham, where can people find your brilliant articles on Substack? Oh, I have a, a website called The Glinner Update, but I'm also back on Twitter now. They unbanned me. But of course, no one reported Back it. on Twitter. Graham, well, actually, what is your Twitter handle? Glinner. Glinner. Nice and easy to remember. <laughs> Let me highly recommend it. Make your uh, New Year's resolution to read the work of this fascinating man. Of course, he's a comic genius as well, don't you know? Uh, thanks, Graham. Coming up, could taking on the unions become the AWOL Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's Falklands moment? My superstar panel will debate that in the media buzz at 10. But first, should we let men be men in 2023? See you in two. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeves & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by Headliners.
on TV, radio and online. This is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. The internet's feistiest woman, the brilliant Leia Halpern, is tonight's outsider. Now, in a world where so-called toxic masculinity has left many blokes walking on eggshells, is it time we let men be men in 2023? Leia certainly thinks so, heralding in the new year with this hard-hitting tweet that read, the lack of masculine role models is the real pandemic. Well, that damning assessment went viral. It broke the internet, sparking a flood of replies that supported her theory, including some men who claimed being masculine was now a crime. And Leia joins me now. Hi, Leia. Hi, great to be here. I didn't know I was Britain's spiciest woman. I like that. Thank you. You most certainly are. And I hope you're going to get <laughs> me to man up in the course of this conversation. Um, have we simply gone too far in trying to stamp out the few bad uh, um, apples amongst the billions of men in the world? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really sad. Um, we live in this femme-centric society whereby we have women raising young boys and essentially raising them in a way which raises them to be women. So if a young boy is competitive, if he's aggressive, he's, if he's a little bit frustrated and he's fighting and he's wrestling, he's told that's bad, he's shamed for being himself and told that that's toxically masculine and he shouldn't do that. Now, that is incredibly dangerous. We also had the Gillette advert a few years ago, um, which shamed boys for the exact same thing. And I actually think that these traits are so important, these competitive traits, this is the traits of aggression and frustration, because this is what's necessary in order for a man to then progress and become the man that he's supposed to be, whether it's um, to build a business, whether it's to you know build muscle and become big and strong and um, just to win in life these are such important traits and unfortunately taking those away um shames boys for just being themselves there's a reason why male suicide is three times higher than um, girls throughout the united kingdom um and it's because every time a man just is doing what men are supposed to do he's told that that's toxically masculine and he's shamed 
Uh, well, that's right. We've just been talking about trans ideology, which, in my view, Leia, is cancelling and erasing women. Uh, but men, in their own way, are being cancelled too. Yeah, men are being cancelled. And I think it's actually having a really bad adverse effect because when men don't have the opportunity to be men, it leaves this space, a space for then women to then have to get into their masculine energy and rise up and fulfill that space. And women aren't happiest when they're being men. It, they don't like it. Women are also repulsed by effeminate men and men are repulsed by masculine women. And so they're, they're just switching all the genders around. And it's sad. It's ruining the male-female dynamics. We're going to war with each other. And um, I think it's going to have very, very disastrous effects um, with years to come. Uh, men in the 70s, however, Leia, weren't great, were they? In the pub all day, expecting the wife or girlfriend to do all the cooking and cleaning and raise the kids. Wasn't there room for improvement among these real men? Yeah, I definitely think there's always room for improvement. And, you know, I don't necessarily even look at the 50s as, as the perfect time. I think things weren't good. You know, men were cheating on their wives. Men didn't appreciate the woman when she was raising the children and creating this beautiful home. And so the pendulum has swung so far the other way in order to make up for this. But I think that we're getting to a point whereby we've gone so far the other way, we realize that that doesn't work. And now we're at a point where men and women actually have this opportunity to appreciate traditional gender roles. Perhaps we will start to move back the other way, meet somewhere in the middle, and a man will actually appreciate a woman who is creating a beautiful home for him, cleaning the house, making beautiful meals, and the woman will really appreciate how hard it is for the man to go out every single day and provide. You know, he, he has stress at, at work. Does he want stress at home too? Probably not. And so I think it teaches us this lesson. Um, and, you know, overall, I could sort of get into why this might be the case. And I think ultimately, strong men are are the backbone of um, society. I think it's the men that go to war. It's the men that fight. It's the men that protect the women and the children. And when you feminize men and you don't have strong men, I think it's much easier for the government to come in and push their ideologies and um, indoctrinate the family. Um, so that's sort of my, my analysis okay. as to why that might be happening. Amen to that. Leia, great to have you on the show. Leia Halpern, do check her out on Twitter. A must read, a very, very uh, compelling commentator and the author of Undressing Bitcoin. She knows a thing or two about finance as well. Lots more to come. Could uh, facing down the unions be Rishi Sunak's Falklands moment? Plus, we can sing naughty songs. See you in two. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
It's 10 o'clock. I'm Mark Dolan in for Dan Wooten tonight. As Britain braces for the worst week of rail disruption for 30 years, could facing down the unions be Rishi Sunak's Falklands moment? And what does he need to do to see off the Marxist barons? I'll poll my superstar panel next. With me tonight, Christine Hamilton, John Sargent and Rebecca Reid. With even a member of the House of Lords urging the runaway royal to pipe down, is it time Prince Harry put a right royal sock in it? Fleet Street icon Kelvin McKenzie is uncancelled at 10.45. As England rugby star Maro Itoji tries to keep a swing low sweet chariot alive despite a backlash to its links to slavery, should sports fans be allowed to sing songs that some consider offensive? Former Mumford and Sons musician turned freedom fighter Winston Marshall weighs in at 10.20. And as a record number of people sign up for Veganuary, despite question marks over the health and environmental benefits of a plant-based diet, is veganism a con? I'll get my panel's thoughts in the media buzz at 10.30. Plus, tomorrow's front page is hot off the press and the first greatest Britain and Union jackass of the year coming up too. But first, the news headlines with my greatest Britain, Aaron Armstrong. Yeah, big shoes to fill. Yes, I'm Aaron Armstrong here in the GB newsroom. Uh, the health secretary is blaming COVID, flu and the threat of strep A for the extra pressure being put on the NHS. His comments come amid mounting concern over the winter crisis, with more than a dozen NHS trusts and ambulance services declaring critical incidents over the festive period. Medical experts say up to 500 people are dying each week as a result of delays in urgent care. But Steve Barclay says the government is working to reduce the backlog. Focusing the funding onto the operations backlogs, for example, getting more diagnostic hubs in place, getting the surgical hubs that we're rolling out, uh, getting the backlog from the pandemic reduced. That's been the key priority. That's where we've surged additional funding. But we also recognise the big pressure that we're seeing played through in terms of ambulance handover delays is largely uh, triggered by those who are fit to leave hospital but delayed in doing so. And we need to free up that bed capacity. And that is often about having the right social care provision to do so. Rail passengers will face continued disruption for the rest of the week as a result of fresh strikes by the RMT union. Roughly half of Britain's railway lines are closed, with only a fifth of services running. Many places, including most of Scotland and Wales, have no trains running at all. The Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, says the government has offered a fair pay offer. The RMT maintains there's been no new proposal and is accusing the government of blocking an agreement. People travelling to the UK from China will not have to self-isolate if they test positive for COVID on arrival. The government says testing is designed to collect information in the absence of transparent coronavirus data from Chinese authorities. From Thursday, those flying to the UK from China will be required to show a negative COVID test before boarding the plane. The disgraced former boss of FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried, has pleaded not guilty to multiple fraud charges following the collapse of his cryptocurrency exchange. He's accused of stealing billions of dollars from customers and investors to fund his hedge fund, buy property and make political donations. Prosecutors say Bankman-Fried orchestrated one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. If convicted, he could face more than 100 years in prison. And thousands of mourners said an emotional farewell to Brazil's greatest sportsman today as thousands paid their final respects to the footballing legend Pele. His coffin, draped in a Brazilian flag, was carried through the streets of Santos on a fire truck to a private family funeral where Pele was finally laid to rest. Earlier, some 230,000 mourners, including the country's new president, filed past Pele's open casket to pay homage to the three-time World Cup winner. Pele died last week at the age of 82 after battling colon cancer. TV online and DAB plus radio. This is GB News. And now it is back to Mark on Dan Whitten tonight. My thanks to Aaron, who returns in an hour's time. Tomorrow's news tonight in our media buzz.
And let's kick off with a first look at tomorrow's front pages. And we begin with the I newspaper, and here's what they've got. Uh, and that is uh, a big story. UK hunts for China's next COVID variant. British health officials, officials will test up to 2,000 Chinese nationals arriving at Heathrow every day, searching for any new COVID variants as virus spreads out of control among China's 1.4 billion population. Uh, so much for zero COVID, eh? And how about the Daily Star? Uh, as the NHS crumbles, our bashful prime minister is still nowhere to be seen. Where's Rishi? Uh, readers urged to check sheds and fridges in case he's trapped inside. Uh, there you go. Well, funny enough, that's, uh, that's the topic of our next conversation. Uh, with me reacting to the big stories of the day are my superstar panel, writer and broadcaster Christine Hamilton, legendary political journalist and broadcaster and author and after-dinner speaker entertainer, probably singer as well, and definitely dancer, John Sargent, and author and journalist, Rebecca Reed. Uh, now, the new year got off to a wretched start for commuters today as Britain entered its worst week of rail disruption for 30 years, thanks to striking workers. A walkout of 40,000 RMT members caused four in five trains to be cancelled in what the Transport Secretary described as an act of self-harm by militant unions. Take a look. Government's going to continue to work really hard to try and help bring the two sides together to get this resolved. I know how frustrating this is for commuters and that the danger is it puts people off using the railways, which is a bit of self-harm on the part of the rail unions that haven't settled this dispute. What I think the government can do is make sure there's a fair and reasonable offer on the table, which there is, facilitate those negotiations between employers and trade unions uh, and try and make sure we get this dispute resolved for the travelling public. The RMT's General Secretary Mick Lynch was back on the picket line today but claims he's ready to sit down with the government to reach a settlement. Well, we want a resolution. We're uh, ready and able to discuss with the companies and the government whenever they uh, want to put that on. We've been hearing the same stuff uh, for six months or more that they want to facilitate a settlement. Well, they've got to prove that now. They've got to change the equation that's being put to us in those talks and we're, we will look forward to that if, that's, if that comes true. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is planning to unveil new anti-strike laws this year to help neuter the militant unions. These plans reportedly include allowing ministers to set their own minimum service threshold and make it harder to call a strike by raising the vote threshold for action from 40 to 50 percent. But with Sunak set for a messy court battle to even get those laws through, could facing down the Marxist union barons be his Falklands moment? Christine Hamilton, uh, you've written a book about great British battle axes. Uh, one figure that featured in your best-selling book was Margaret Thatcher. Um, so could this be Rishi Sunak's Falklands moment, his Thatcher moment? Honestly, Mark, if it wasn't so serious, I, well, I am laughing. The idea that Rishi Sunak can ever approach Margaret Thatcher. First of all, she had charisma and she had conviction. She was a conviction politics. The Iron Lady, she had, she had balls of steel. We really don't know what metal Rishi Sunak is made of, to be honest, but, I mean, this is crunch time with the unions. It's, it's a game of chicken that they're playing. Mick Lynch seems to think he's the Arthur Scargill of his day. He's an unreconstructed 1970s-style trade unionist. It's whoever blinks first. And if the government blinks first, they're finished. They're probably finished anyway. And if the government blinks first, we're all finished. I mean, we currently subsidise the railways to the tune of about £1,300 per person. I mean, the, the railways are deeply in debt. We cannot go on subsidising them anymore. They got massive giving... support during the pandemic. Well, yes, they did, but I don't think the public are going to support them in these strikes. Mm. I mean, I think the, the support... We're, we're heading for a general strike. We've almost got it. And don't tell me that these strikes are not coordinated. We've got... Everybody will be out on strike shortly. And I think the public's sympathy will be much greater towards the NHS than it is towards the railways. I mean, we will see. But the government have got to stand firm. Otherwise, we just have inflationary wage agreements going on and on and on, and nobody wins, we all lose. Do you know what, Mark? I think that the general public think that this country... They don't realise what a bad state this country is in. They mm. don't realise that we're living on borrowed money, we're living on borrowed time, and we are in a hell of an economic mess. Well, we are, and, and you're absolutely right that Rishi Sunak is unproven. We can't characterise him as 
Mrs Thatcher Mark II just yet, but this is his opportunity to cast himself in that mould. I mean, he's certainly got the work ethic, the attention to detail. I wonder whether you're underestimating him. Well, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, where has he been all these months? Why? We had his, um, I don't know what he calls it, it wasn't a party political broadcast, it was some sort of address to the nation he did the other day in yeah. the form of a question and answer. It was so underwhelming. This man is in charge of the country, for heaven's but sake. But isn't that what he's doing? He's busy running the country, trying to sort out the migrant crisis, get the Northern there, Ireland protocol resolved and, and potentially making a plan to tackle the unions. There's a happy medium. I quite agree. We don't necessarily want somebody who's all out front and doing nothing behind. So you're suggesting that he's like the swan, serenely on the water. He's paddling hard underneath. Well, I, fairly soon we're going to need some proof of that. John Sargent, what do you make of Rishi Sunak's strategy when it comes to the unions? No, I think he's got... Time is a great problem. They've got to try and slow down the whole idea so that they can reach some kind of agreement. It won't be victory, but it does mean that on both sides they've got to accept that it isn't going to be a victory. So it's very important for the striking rail workers to realise that they're going nowhere. And it's also extremely important for the government not to think that they can win a kind of Falklands mm. victory. Of course they can't. Not in these circumstances. But timing is everything when it comes to an industrial dispute. Offers that you make too early and are then rejected means you have to start the whole thing all over again. You must give the impression to the strikers that they're going nowhere. If you start trickling out little offers and actually I'll, come, I'll see you next week, we'll do a bit more on this, mm. forget it. The government have got to appear implacable until they break. And of course they will break at some point. I suspect they will try and hold on so that it's to do with the, the next pay round. Mm. Because these pay bodies that they go on about, they've, they're quite good at looking back. They're not very good at looking forward. So if you can get them into a position where, in April, they're looking back, they could be remarkably generous. And people say, oh, what goodness me? But you hid behind the pay bodies to start with, and now you're stuck with the fact they're recommending quite big increases, and then the government say, yes, we'll accept them. This is what happened before, you know, in the 70s, which I covered as a reporter. You always got this sort of sequence of events but where you, that you, you, at one point, you appear to be... Whatever happens, we must do this. And then you use that because the time changes everything. In another month or so, it will not be much fun for people on strike. It really isn't. Well, they're and losing, the public they're support losing, begins to dwindle as well. And the public support They're losing a lot of money. The average strike oh, sure. and Lynch isn't losing But you'd anything. lose more money. You'd lose more money if you didn't... If, you know, if you think you can just give in... You would end up losing far more money. No, but you've got You're to make sure. Talking about the strikers giving in or the government giving in. Both have got to give it in their own way. You've got to make the deal. The deal has got to come at the right moment. It's not right at the moment. It really isn't right. Yes. It's too early. Yes. Now uh, you've reported uh, in great depth and with great analysis uh, about multiple prime ministers, uh, Margaret Thatcher and, and beyond. This is a test of Rishi Sunak. Um, strategically, um, yeah. his judgment, a test of his judgment, and this, this poker game that he's playing with the union. Absolutely. But it's also a test of his character, isn't That's it? That's it. And whether he's got those balls of steel or not. Mm. Do, you, do you suspect he has them? I think he does, yeah, because he is really up against it. It's not a... He doesn't have to choose very many alternatives. There aren't many. They really give in too early and everyone will then run over you. Mm. So, I mean, you just... You then... The whole pay row will then collapse. And you think, God, what was all that about? To, that failure would be too big. So if, You've got to fudge yeah. it. He can't... He's only got two options. He can, I, if he gives in, that's a disaster. He's just got to fudge it at some point. It's just a question of when does he do it. And it's a potential easy win if he does get this right, uh, because he'll look strong and dynamic, won't he? Not an easy win, but, the, but, he, but put it this way, the danger of giving in mm. is, would so weaken his position mm. that that is far worse than some fudge. But he can't give in because everybody else will then yeah, rabbit over exactly. the top you of it. Although, we'll we'll Rebecca, one after another. Uh, potentially it's an easy win if you consider that his opponent is Keir Starmer, who is in the pocket of the union barons. I'm not, I'm not sure in the pocket of the union barons is a well, fair the description. The unions are bankrolling the Labour Party to a degree, aren't they? I, I think there has always been a, an important and strong relationship between the unions and the leader of the Labour Party. But can um, Labour be tough with the unions if they're being bankrolled by them? 
I I don't know. It will be very interesting to see when they win the next election, which I think is almost certainly what's going to happen. Um, I hope that Keir Starmer... I mean, he's a very intelligent, very sensible man. Uh, I'm not saying he's the most charismatic person who's ever lived, but I do think he's a safe pair of hands and he's a sensible grown-up, and I think he will have probably given some thought to that problem. What I'm seeing at the moment is the lumping together of all the unions and all the strikes, and I think that's the mistake. I think they should be taken individually. I think that the railways at the moment are... They're digging their own grave because all automation is coming and people will remember this and they are inconveniencing mm. people and they don't have the goodwill that nurses do. No. The, the, the med people who work in medicine have, worked, have been running on fumes for years and they just went through a whole pandemic whereas people who worked on trains actually had a quieter, more peaceful job during the pandemic. Therefore, it's not going to be a great moment for Rishi Sunak to upset a load of nurses, mm. but it might be a good moment in the general public perception to stand up to Mick Lynch and his ilk. Mick Lynch's PR is really wobbling now, and I think that's the issue that I'm seeing for the and rail why strikes. why do you think his PR is wobbling? I think because people are enthusiastic about strikes, and we've all seen Billy Elliot, until you're standing on a platform and you're really cold and it's January and you can't get to work, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the difference is... I've been in hospital with my baby, like, in and out. She's a baby, she's always going to hospital. Um, and I've seen how hard those people work to keep it going. And I'm not sure that you get the same sense of enormous goodwill from rail workers. No. no. I'm I mean, sure is, that... Is but there also any the, the, Go on, go on. So I was just saying, also, the rail workers are causing massive knock-on adverse effects to, for example, the hospitality industry. Exactly. And the retail industry. I mean, yeah. the, the shop... People couldn't get to the shops in the run-up to Christmas. And look at the number of restaurants. I don't know, I can't quote the figure, but the number of restaurants and places who had... Christmas parties cancelled. And black cab drivers Absolutely were telling devastating. me. Yeah. It was. The timing of those strikes was churlish, yeah. wasn't it? It was, it was cruel. It was cruel. Well, it was to good. other people selfish. It was I good union from Mick coming... Lynch. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a power move from him. If I, were, if, I, if I were in his union, I'd be pleased by it. But as a rail user, I would feel less pleased. Doesn't by make him. you popular, think, though, does no, it? No, it doesn't. And I think adversely. the other thing that, that makes it harder for them, again, it's this question of timing. Keep going because people are going to realise that whatever happens, rail fares are going to go up sharply. They've already been announced that they're going to go up. Mm. That will wear in on people. You see, it's, the, the mistake people often make when they look at these situations is they think it's sort of static, that they're this, they're that, and so on, then mm. this. Whereas it's changing all the time. Every week that goes by, people are more thinking, yeah... But they're rather inefficient, aren't they, in the railway industry? And I think why do they need I... all these people doing maintenance jobs? Uh, uh, why yeah. do they need and that? People I'm very, people I'm very don't... rarely <coughs> called upon to give Rishi my opinions, but were he to call me, I would use my girls' school logic, which is my enemy's enemy is my friend, and I would say, let's be really nice to the nurses and really mean to the railway workers, and that way you split this sense of general solidarity for all of the unions. I don't necessarily agree with it, but that's what I would do. Look at you Rishi. giving top but tips. But far, far fewer people Christine. need the railways exactly. now, because more people working from home, the, the average community... And now they've been put off the railways. Of course they have. Well, I mean, I had to come here by car... The but trust isn't there, Christine. ..couldn't use the railways. And even when you do pay a fortune to the railways, um, you still can't get a seat. John um, Sargent, um, I've always wanted to say this. Give me mm. ten seconds. Um, could, <laughs> right. if he handles it badly, could the unions derail this government? Oh! I don't think, I don't think they're powerful enough to do that. No, I don't. Right. And the, I mean, the, the big difference in the 1970s and where the issue was so critical was, hold on a moment, who's governing the country? That was the issue that Ted Heath put to the electorate. People aren't saying that now. People don't think the unions are running the country. No. They think a lot of people are very cross and are going on strike, for which many people have sympathy for. I can understand that. But the idea that sort of Rishi Sunak has got to, that he must compromise with these union barons, whatever you want to call them. No, 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 he's not under that pressure. He's under pressure very much from the other side, particularly within his own party from, as Christina says, you know, don't give in to this. He's only got a short time before the next election. And if he loses this one, well, that's it. People, people particularly on the, on the Conservative benches, would just think this is it, it's all over. There you go. Well, mm. could facing down the unions be red meat? to disillusioned Conservative voters. Speaking of which, as a record number of people sign up to Veganuary, despite question marks over the health and environmental benefits of a plant-based diet, is veganism a big con? My superstar panel return to answer that in the media buzz at 10.30. But first, 
as England rugby star uh, Meiro uh, Itogi tries to keep iconic song Swing Low alive despite a backlash, should sports fans be allowed to sing songs that are deemed offensive? Former Mumford & Sons musician turned freedom fighter Winston Marshall is next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. If we don't reject masks, they will be with us forever. That was the topic of my Daily Digest monologue, which I'm delighted to say that Paige from our digital team has crafted into an excellent video. You can catch it now on Twitter, at GB News. And well done, Paige, who's one of our best people working from home tonight. It can be done. Uh, now, English rugby fans have come under increasing fire in recent times for their rendition of Swing Low, Sweet Chariot with even the Rugby Football Union attempting to phase it out. The 19th century lyrics were written by Indigenous American and liberated slave Wallace Willis, and critics argue it's offensive for modern sport fans to trivialise the hellish experience of slaves in America. Rugby star uh, Maro Itoji, of course, England rugby star, had previously come out to slam the song last summer, 
but seem to have seen sense during a BBC Radio 4 appearance yesterday. First of all, I don't think anyone at Twickenham is singing that song out of malice. Most people sing that song to support their team, support English rugby. I'm not going to sit here and tell people what they should or shouldn't sing. I think everyone has the choice to make up their mind on that matter. This is one for individuals to make their mind up on. Well, I'm delighted to be joined by musician and former Mumford & Sons lead guitarist Winston Marshall. Uh, Winston, great to have you on the show. Is it wrong to demonise these songs of the past? Mark, thanks for having me on. Yes, of course it is. Uh, this is a ridiculous story. I was kind of comical to even comment on this. So for a start, uh, uh, Maro Otoji uh, seems like a, a very nice bloke and uh, notes that he doesn't think anyone's singing in malice. Well, actually, it takes quite some mental gymnastics to really argue that this is this song is mm. sung in malice. As you note, the song written in 1865, uh, a song about the Underground Railroad in America where slaves uh, tried to find their freedom. It's a, it's a mournful song uh, in, 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 in the face of one of the most horrific injustices we've known. And, uh, it, but it's a hopeful song. And, and uh, why did England rugby fans start singing the song? Because in 1987, there was a star player called Martin of Fire, whose nickname, because he was so fast and his surname was O'Fire, was Martin Chariots O'Fire. So they found a song that had the word chariots in, swing low, sweet chariot. It's a song of praise, an endearing song for that player. So now, apparently some people find this song, is think this song is being sung in malice. Well, obviously, it's not. Why is it actually, uh, the, the, uh, if it's not malice, the, the problem, what the real problem is, is this idea of cultural appropriation. When did the Rugby Football Union start complaining about this? It was after the George Floyd murder in June 2020, when everything was combed over to find something offensive. And of course, if you want to find something offensive in something, you can find it anywhere you look. So they found it in this song. Yes, and one man's cultural appropriation is another man's cultural celebration. Well, look, I'm a banjo player. Now, where did the banjo come from? Well, actually, the banjo wouldn't exist if it weren't for the slave trade. It, it, it didn't exist before Africans were, were deported and moved in that horrendous trade to the Caribbean. And then after a long period of time, when they were eventually given spare time, they, they built the, the banjo from their memories of the instruments that existed in Africa, but it didn't exist then. Now, does that mean I can't play the banjo? And does that mean that you know, Billy Connolly started his career as a banjo player uh, with, with Jerry Raffelty in The Humble Bums? Uh, before going into comedy. Steve Martin, the, co the comedian, is a great banjo player. Now, if we're going to talk about cultural appropriation, rugby was invented in England. And if cultural appropriation is the problem, then everyone else, apart from English people, should stop playing rugby because that would be cultural appropriation. It's insanity. Yes, maybe we should cancel the Beatles for being inspired by Chuck Berry, for God's sakes. Um, listen, Winston, we've seen right. songs like Brown Sugar effectively being banned with the Rolling Stones saying they'll never play that song live again uh, because the lyrics deal with the issue of black women being exploited by slavers. Uh, banning songs, is that progress? Well, uh, I certainly don't think so. I mean... There was another um, uh, political regime that banned the song Swing Low, Sweet Chariot in 1939. It was the Nazi regime. And they banned Swing Low, Sweet Chariot because it was a song of hope for uh, Africans, America, African Americans. And, and uh, of course, they were a deeply racist regime. And that's the only precedent we're following here, it seems. Uh, definitely. Now, Winston, do you think that, um, with, with what we've heard there from Marrow, that there's now some pushback to some of this woke stuff? Do you think that 2023 might be the year that woke ideology, censorship, cancel culture begins to end? Mark, we've all had enough. It's just a joke. It's just so silly. We we don't... We want to sing songs, not... All this extra baggage, it's just... It's mm. been 
placed on top of it. It's a load of nonsense, and I think everyone's had enough. Well, definitely. I mean, if you were in the Rolling Stones, you've been in one of the world's top bands. I mean, would you lobby that the Stones should continue to play brown sugar because there are millions of people of colour for the last few decades that have listened to that song, they've danced to it, they've probably made love to it, and it might be many people's favourite song, but now we'll never hear it live again. Look, the Rolling Stones can do what they want. Free speech is also means the freedom to not do things if mm. they choose not to. But if I'm not allowed to listen to that song, that's another thing altogether. And, and that's where the line is to be drawn. And in the case of this, this rugby thing, it's, uh, they're telling fans not to sing the song. And that's, and that's where the problem is. You can't tell people what to say and not say. You, maybe if people, individuals, as uh, Maro Itoje suggests, if individuals say they don't want to sing a song, fair enough. But you cannot start telling people what they can and can't sp say, speak, hear or sing. Uh, definitely. And of course, the debate you've raised very intelligently is, is that actually this song may not even be offensive if you place it in its historical context, uh, just like the fairy tale of New York contains the F word in relation to gay people, but this is sung by one of the characters in the song who's a scoundrel, so it's in context, therefore probably not offensive, just a characterization of a scoundrel. Um, but isn't the point about great art that at times it can offend and it will offend, and that's okay too? Well, I think great art ought to offend sometimes. I mean, it depends what you mean by offend. As I said earlier, you can find anything offensive, but okay, then you can you'll start going into the individual behaviour of each artist. Well, we're going to stop listening to Gary Glitter. We're going to stop listening to Kanye West because of the individual things they say. If you look for offence, whether it's in the lyrics, whether it's in the behaviour of the artists you will 100% succeed in finding a reason not to like or listen to a song or a piece of art. That's because we're humans, we're all uh, uh, fallible, we all have faults and we all make mistakes. And, and so by this kind of measure, this progressive idea that everything has to be a certain way and, and crystal clean and... and politically correct it's just it'll destroy our and and but as i, I think as a pushback i think no one buys it anymore here's hoping uh, we are tired of this woke bs uh, if you are then why don't you check out winston's brilliant podcast it's called uh, martial matters available from all good platforms uh, where you get your podcasts and it's uh, a much listened to offering um, and uh, and check out Winston on Twitter, Mr. Win Marshall. Uh, love you to catch up. Winston, speak soon. Uh, brilliant stuff. There you go, uh, Winston Marshall. By the way, rock god as well. Coming up with even a member of the House of Lords urging the runway royal to pipe down, is it time for Prince Harry to put a right royal sock in it? Fleet Street icon Kelvin McKenzie gives his blistering verdict in Uncancelled at 10.45. But first, as record numbers sign up to Veganuary, making January even more miserable for themselves, is veganism a big con? My superstar panel return, and we got more of tomorrow's front pages in the media buzz. See you shortly. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. 
Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the center of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fungary debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, The People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back to the show. Let's return to tomorrow's news tonight. Do you like that little Zoom? It's very exciting. Honestly, it's, uh, it's all bells and whistles here on uh, Dan Wooden tonight. More front pages are hot off the press. Let's have a look at the Daily Mail. Let's not return to face mask madness or oh, crumbs. It's almost like they've listened to my <laughs> monologue. Yeah. Um, as health chiefs advise flu sufferers to wear coverings, MPs warn against COVID-style curbs. Um, let's have a look at The Guardian. Doctors condemn delusional PM after he denies crisis in the NHS. He was our hero. Brazil bids farewell to King Pelé. Uh, Daily Telegraph. Maths at the heart of the Prime Minister's vision for Britain. Sunak sets out principles in major speech as he battles striking unions and NHS backlog. Museum lines up loan deal to repatriate the Elgin marbles. Another fascinating debate that we may raise on tomorrow night's show. The Times now infinite number of other migrants ready to replace Albanians. Compulsory maths until 18 for every school child. Sunak on personal mission to reform education. And also, tired of pushy parenting, try self-drive pram. For the exhausted parents of young children like Rebecca Reed, yeah. there may finally be some respite. A self-driving smart pram that can lull babies to sleep and help tired mothers and fathers to avoid walking into lampposts has been unveiled at the world's biggest technology fair. So all you need now is a robot to change the nappy. The Sun newspaper, no, we'll come to a couple of other papers later. But first, uh, let's get to this next burning issue of the day and reacting to it, my superstar panel, writer and broadcaster Christine Hamilton, legendary political journalist John Sargent and best-selling author and writer Rebecca Reed. Now, this year marks the 10th anniversary of Veganuary, the month-long pledge to reject meat and other animal products such as cheese, eggs, all the good stuff, basically. And in 2023, more people than ever are reportedly taking the plunge with a new sign-up every 2.4 seconds. I'm amazed they've got the energy. Uh, this is all according to the charity that started it. But have these poor ravenous souls been fed a lie? Is veganism really good for you and the planet, as claimed by plant-based protagonists. Uh, cattle and sheep account for as little as 3.7% of UK emissions when agricultural methods that help remove carbon from the atmosphere are taken into account. As for the so-called health benefits, Jane Buxton, author of The Great Plant-Based Con, told The Telegraph that plant-based diets provide inferior quality protein and are deficient in important nutrients 
such as iron, omega-3 and vitamin A, yet are abundant in potentially harmful compounds. But with the fake meat market expected to be worth more than £25 billion, pounds, that's right, £25 billion by 2026, don't expect the establishment or the uh, food industry to abandon their anti-beef brainwashing anytime soon. So, Rebecca Reed, are you plant-based? I'm not plant-based, but I do try to eat less meat. Uh, apparently, the average person in the UK will consume meat or, or a meat-derived product on average three times a day, which is insane. Um, the main issue is that we eat too much of some things and not enough of others, and we don't eat seasonally. So, really, it's fine to eat meat, but you should be trying to buy meat from a butcher and you should be trying to buy, to, to, trying to buy good quality meat. Also, not just, like, the prime beef bits, but the things that are a bit less sexy. Yeah. Um, learn to cook it properly and then use all of the animals. So if you roast a chicken, then make stock, then make soup and make multiple meals from one animal. That's a really sensible way to consume meat. The issue is that we don't really cook properly in this country. Lots of people don't know how to cook. So it's not that you should not eat meat at all, but you should pro almost all of us should be eating way less. I think we're all going round to Rebecca's, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm in complete agreement with, with Rebecca. She's obviously got all the right ideas. Um, <laughs> I, no, I was watching the Attenborough film the other, the other night, that The, was your first the you know, Frozen Planet, mm. and you just think, gosh, we're all animals, aren't we? We're mm. all so much part of that sort of food chain. And the idea that even the fubbiest, uh, lovely-looking animals are busy, ready to snarl and bite and eat and each other and so on. And you feel that's very deep, isn't it? And you, the idea that you simply, by matter of an argument, oh, you know, I don't think we ought to, to kill animals. Oh, yes, that's attractive. No, let's not do that. But then when you think of the history of man, yeah. and you think, God, it's so much part Mm. Oh, it has been for millennia part of our lives, part of how we've survived. Well, and the yes. idea that you casually, or not, mm. on your, you might give it up in January, but I'm not surprised that people don't creep back in June and July and think, I'm not sure I like That's this. Barbecue and season. also, John, hasn't it served us quite well for millennia? And aren't there big concerns about a plant-based diet? First of all, the agricultural argument, um, supposedly meat is bad for the planet, but what about vast monocrop agriculture from the production of soy, corn and wheat? Yes, I think people don't realise that a lot of the, all the cattle and the sheep, they're only there because we eat them. Mm. So, I mean, it's not a matter of, oh, somehow they would be there as well and we would be there and we're living in sort of happy harmony with them. Mm. And you think, well, actually, this isn't... It's not a realistic description mm. of how either they live or we live. And the, the, the effect on the environment and what would Britain look like with no sheep, no cattle, no this, no that, that somehow we'd be purer and we'd be better people, it, it doesn't ring with me. That doesn't... Especially lamb that graze on, on territory that would be uninhabitable yeah. for humans and, and we can't eat grass. Yeah. And you, you think and there'd be no chickens, there'd be no this, and, and wouldn't it be lovely? No, it'd be quiet. <laughs> and we'd be hungry, wouldn't we, Christine? Now, I've well, heard that Neil's a big fan of your forib. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, what I object to is vegan absolutism. I mean, my motto is that I eat what I like and I let the food fight it out inside me, which was Mark Twain's motto, and that's, that's the way I operate. Rebecca's absolutely right. I mean, people who eat meat four times a day, that, that, that's crazy, and I think that's over the top. But if you want to be vegan, fine, go off and do it. But all these people doing veganuary... Apparently, 84% of people who take up veganism don't continue with it. Now, that's obviously a very loose percentage because how do you know, etc. Mm. But there are various reasons why people are vegans. I mean, they're, they're vegans for ethical reasons, they're re vegan for environmental reasons and for health reasons, and some are vegan for religious reasons. So, you know, if people... If people want to eschew all the wonderful of things of life, like eggs and dairy and goodness knows what, but they're then welcome. But again, this business of using all the animal... I mean, I spent quite a long time after Christmas getting every last scrap of meat off the turkey, boiling it down into stock, making soup out of all the bits and bobs that were left over. And, of course, this is the real problem, is food waste. Mm. Uh, frankly, people are not taught how to cook properly and they're not taught how to deal with what's left over when you've taken the rich. I pick, think also people were. have this real desire to divorce meat from an animal. So I know lots of people who will say, oh, I can't eat it if it's got bones in it, I can't eat it if it's... Well, th yeah. Then you shouldn't eat meat. You should only be eating meat if actually, if you can deal with the fact that it did come from an animal and you should be handling it and you should be respecting the fact that it was once alive. Well, people won't... People who will happily eat chicken present them with rabbit 
which, as far as I'm concerned, mm. is free because our neighbour shoots rabbits and goodness knows what, they won't eat it because... I Don't, don't yeah. ask me why, because it's not no, because it's they think... Though, to be fair, Christine, I yes. couldn't eat horse. So I sort of... Christine. I'm inconsistent on that, but I really couldn't. I've offered some scepticism um, in relation to the environmental case for plant-based, because it... it oh, also, I'm not it also putting that on, forward. No, it, it relies also on, on pesticides and, and fertilisers. Mm. Mm. And there's some concern about how much topsoil we've got left, mm. which, as John mentioned, is helped by cows and sheep who mm. poo and wee on it. Absolutely. Which preserves yeah. the topsoil. Yeah. But briefly, the medical case, the scientific case for a vegan-based diet doesn't look great either. No, does it? I mean, no. anecdotally, we can talk about, you know, vegan friends that are always having naps and stuff, but um, a recent study suggested that vegan children are about an inch shorter than kids raised on a mm. meat-based diet. I'm not... Uh, look, I'm not... How do you experiment? A... How do you do that, though? Well, this was a... Yeah, How do you was, carry that out That would have to be very long-term, wouldn't it? This was, uh, this yeah. was uh, based upon statistics. I think it was... Uh, I think it was uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital. Yeah, but you need, ideally, to get a child... <laughs> You'd of, have you know, to know how tall and their parents were. And then you've got were, to then reproduce the exact thing. Yeah, so yeah, here's yeah. a child that mm. was a vegan, here's a child that wasn't vegan. Well, there's no Let's way that those two lads of yours, who I know personally, but... strapping lads, would, would be anything like what they are if they hadn't enjoyed all those ribeyes. Um, can I suggest, though, Christine, take a look at this briefly. Uh, our brilliant senior producer, Chris, Chris Eastwood, is a vegan. Uh, do you want to just cast your verdict on... <laughs> On Chris, well, I think he's quite a good advert, isn't he, Rebecca, yeah. for the yeah. vegan diet? I think, sorry, we should just clarify, it is perfectly possible to be a non-malnourished vegan. But I'm also... Think about what you eat. Look at, look at those kind eyes and look at that rich, lustrous hair, Christine. Did he, did he yeah. consent no, to this? No, 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 nobody's no saying does. that all vegans are malnourished, etc., etc. I wonder no, if, no, he takes, vegan if, you want. if he takes any sort of supplements. No, he doesn't do any of that. It's generally agreed, as I understand it, by the medical profession, that you do not get enough... Of all the well, there you go. Well, look, I tell you something. Uh, I know uh, for a fact that Chris Eastwood gets plenty of everything he needs, um, and especially working alongside Dan Wooten, who's back on Monday. Uh, well done, Chris. Great show tonight. Coming up, the power is in my hands. It's the first Greatest Britain and Union Jackass of 2023. Uh, my panel make their nominations. But next, is it time for Harry to put a right royal sock in it? Fleet Street legend Kelvin McKenzie's next. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. It's time now for Uncancelled. Where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. Prince Harry's Monathon shows no signs of slowing with another 
ranting royal stating in another interview that he's had enough and he wants his family back. Take a listen. It never needed to be this way. The leaking and the planting, I want a family, not an institution. They feel as though it's better to keep us somehow as the villains. They've shown absolutely no willingness to reconcile. I would like to get my father back. I would like to have my brother back. Harry seems to be forgetting it was him who walked away from his family and his country in the first place before going on to trash them at any opportunity. After a sit-down with Oprah, a six-hour Netflix series and a memoir, Brits have heard more than enough from the Sussexes. And now even a member of the House of Lords, former MEP and Northern Irish Assembly member Lord Kilcooney, has been pushed to breaking point, tweeting, Would someone please tell Harry to shut up? Well, one man who agrees with that sentiment is Fleet Street icon Kelvin McKenzie. Kelvin, is it time that Prince Harry put a right royal sock in it? Well, I think the issue is that... Uh, you can see my mic there. Sorry about that. Um, the issue really is I'd love him to shut up, but he was never going to shut up. Why? Because somebody has probably paid him $2 million or possibly more for the advance, and therefore he needs the publicity in order to sell the book. The book won't sell particularly well, but the, but the marketing will be great for, for him, especially in the United States. My issue is with the guy who interviewed him. Now, Tom Bradby says in his Wikipedia, or it's written in his Wikipedia, that he is a journalist. Well, when it comes to interviewing um, Prince Harry, he's not a journalist at all. He's a lickspittle. He, how are you, Harry? How's it all going? How's the mental health? Have you heard about my mental health? Have you heard about that? And right, so he gets paid. I don't know what he gets paid by ITV. Why doesn't he ask him some serious questions? Why did you do it? Why on earth did you debunk like this? Why are you coming on this television station to attack us? Why do you think that more than half of your original nation, the United Kingdom, doesn't want you to be the Duke of Sussex anymore and it doesn't want the Duchess of Sussex at any price? Where are those questions? Where well, are they? They Can never they happen and they don't happen. And yet, and yet, and yet Piers Morgan gets fired, right? For, for, for being hostile to Meghan, the way to get on ITV and the way to get on in conventional television, with the exception, with the unique exception, by the way, of GB News, is actually, is actually to bowl up patsy questions to members of the bloody royal family. Honestly, it, it, uh, Bradby is a complete disgrace, to be honest with you. And, um, and, yeah. I, and, and I have no idea why ITV keep wheeling out these guys to ask easy questions. Like they if should get you... Dan Wooden to ask the question. Now you're talking a proper journalist, Kelvin. Um, speaking of which, if you were still at the helm of a national newspaper, how would you be treating Harry at the moment? I'd be poor. There wouldn't be a bucket big enough to pour the mead over him. I, he would be getting the whole nine yards. He, he, he's a disgrace to his... What about his own family? What's the point of going on national television and basically pissing on your own brother? I, and, or as I understand it in spare, he let, even gives a whack to the sister-in-law and his dad doesn't come out too well. That is the easiest thing in the world to do. Every family, every family has issues. And the great thing about the royal family for literally decades is that virtually it was going on all the time, but you only ever got snippets. Diana wasn't holding press conferences where she did it. She did it once, actually. But outside that, she kept by and large stuff. And by the way, she then left the royal family. Harry wants it both ways. He wants the title. He wants the money. He wants the 14 bathroomed house in California. And the only way he can get it is keep pissing on his own family. He's a disgrace. World-class commentary from Fleet Street legend Kelvin McKenzie. Speak soon, Kelvin. Brilliant stuff. He's not pulling his punches, and he never has done. Uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, a big reaction on email to this. But it's time now to reveal today's Greatest Britain and Union Jackass. Uh, yes, indeed, with me to reveal there's my superstar panel. We've got Christine Hamilton, John Sargent and Rebecca Reid. Christine, your Greatest Britain. Well, my greatest Britons, plural, are 
everybody who was refusing to give up anything for January and who is resolutely refusing to make any New Year resolution that they're going to immediately break. Amen to that. They don't work. <laughs> uh, John Sargent, your greatest Britain. It's an honorary one. Martina Navrola is still over. Oh, yeah. And her openness about her difficulties with cancer, I think it's particularly poignant for someone who's a great sporting star and a great athlete to admit that her body's giving up. And for her to do so with, with such sort of sense of optimism and it's not so bad, I think was being absolutely marvellous. Huge dignity. Uh, Rebecca Reid, briefly, your greatest Briton. Um, Pele, greatest footballer of all time and also, by all accounts, a very, very nice man. Well, I love Pele, but I'm going to agree with John. I'm going to give it to Martina Navratilova and we wish her a speedy recovery from two types of cancer. What a hero she is. OK, and how about your uh, union jackass? Uh, do your worst, Christine. Well, I'm sorry to be repetitive because I've nominated him before, but Prince Harry. Yep, say no more. <laughs> and, and you don't even need a reason on my watch. John Sargent. Uh, I'd like to choose John Stonehouse. Those of you who have been oh, watching yes. the fictional... Uh, you know, series on him, we'll know what a bounder he was. Gosh. Yeah. He managed to betray his country, his wife, his friends, and all the people he the defrauded. First, the first in a long line of dodgy MPs, John. What a great nomination. And, Rebecca, briefly, your union jackass. Rishi Sunak for reneging on the, um, the childcare support that we were supposed to be getting and well, not going to. I do like Rishi, but I'll give you Rishi Sunak because it's all about the mums and dads. Thanks for watching. We're back tomorrow at 9. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing.